Welcome to Medical Myths, Legends, and Fairy Tales. I'm your host, Dr. Alan Christensen. Look, you know that between the latest online fads and the crazy media headlines, it's easier than ever to get confused about your health. And you and I just want to feel better and live longer. We want to know what works. And we can't wait for further studies. We need to make decisions today based on the best evidence we've got. Well, that's exactly what this show is here for. So let's get to it. Hey, Dr. Sia with you. Let's take a deep dive into dairy foods and their iodine content. So, oh, this is a tough one. Um, dairy foods, yeah, you know, many people do have allergic issues, uh, intolerances, poor digestive symptoms from them. And at the same time, they are among the densest sources of some nutrients. You know, calcium, we've got them fortified with vitamin D, vitamin A, They're rich in bioflavin. They've got a lot of potassium, magnesium. They can be a good source of protein, but they are just up there in their iodine content. Several papers have shown that most adults in the modern world, dairy foods may be their largest single contributor of iodine. The other problems that can be the most variable source of iodine. The amount of iodine in milk products can vary by a factor of 10 from batch to batch. From some recent assays, here's some examples. Um, you can find a cup of skim milk that offers you 360 micrograms of iodine per serving. And remember, we're thinking about 200 micrograms as a safe upper limit, 100 as an upper limit if you're working to reset your thyroid function. And yeah, you can get 360 in a glass of milk. Uh, you know, a tricky thing, some of the charts that talk about iodine content per food talk about it by weight. And the, a, a glass of milk weighs more than a piece of solid food because most of the weight is water. So I did have to make some corrections because of that. And you'll see lower lists for iodine and milk in some places, but often because they didn't really correct for the weight differences. Uh, yogurts, you know, low-fat, fruit-flavored yogurt, you can have 228 micrograms per serving. 2% milk might be 150. And it's not to say that 2% is consistently lower than skim. It's just random variation. Milkshakes can be 120. Uh, you can see 120 in whole milk. Unsweetened yogurts from whole milk might be 30 per serving. Cream cheese might be 30 micrograms per serving. But there's a bunch there. So why is it there? You know, I heard a joke about what a cowboy called seafood, and that was a cow in a pond, you know. So yeah, cows aren't from the ocean, but what's up with this iodine? Well, the problem is that it's a contaminant. We think that dairy cows, normally their diets have a lot of goitrogenic compounds. So they would eat clover, they would eat grasses. And what these do is they bind up with iodine and they lower its absorption. And if you were a cow, that came out just about perfect. But when the diets are not as heavily based upon goitrogenic grasses, they can overabsorb iodine. So that, that's one problem. Probably a larger factor though is that it, the process is called teat dipping. So teats are the little nipples on the cow's udder, in case you weren't clear on that. I grew up on a farm, so I, I had to access those things in the morning sometimes. But, but no, so they would dip the teats in iodine so they wouldn't get infected. The milking machines, having little cups that sit on each teat, have a fair amount of, of suction, and they can irritate the skin. And when they're on for long periods of time, there's a risk of mastitis or infection of the udder. So yeah, so teat sanitizers are used regularly. And that's much more extensive now than it was as recently as the 80s. The other problem is that cows are given mineral supplements to fortify their feed. And the amount of iodine in those supplements is now known to be greater than necessary. And then the last wrinkle is that cows can be given fish meal as a cheap source of protein. And fish meal, as you could guess, is pretty high in iodine. Now, funny thing, but we've watched how that the US had their rates of thyroid disease shoot up with iodine fortification. The UK had something really similar happen. About the same years, their rate of thyroid disease went up, but they didn't have a salt fortification process. They didn't really go through that. And now we know though, that those same years, they started adding more iodine to cattle feed than we did. And so when we look at the amount of iodine present in the population, theirs went up when ours went up, even though they didn't fortify with salt. They fortified their cows and they drank the milk from the cows, so they were still getting more, but just for different reasons. 
Um, something else we see is that organic dairy products, they can be a little bit lower. Now, I'll give some context. When you're on the reset phase and you're working to improve your thyroid, I still wouldn't make organic dairy products part of your daily diet because they're still going to be too much. But as a generalization, you can find that organic dairy, you know, might have about 240 micrograms per liter, uh, whereas conventional might have 427. So it's about half as much. And the reason for this difference is thought to be back to what I mentioned about the cows consuming goitrogens. So when cows consume things like uh, uh, canola seed plant and clover and alfalfa, they're consuming more glucosinolates and therefore they're going to absorb less iodine. Now, a quick thing about the canola plant, it's actually listed as rapeseed. I hate that name. It's a horrible name. But no, this is the canola plant. And yes, cows that make organic dairy and also cows that are used for organic meat are often fed off of the green of that plant. And it's a cruciferous vegetable like broccoli is. So yeah, I wouldn't be frightened of it. I've written about that in a lot of detail elsewhere. So we can see that dairy has so much, but it's not been like that. These amounts have gone up radically in the last few decades, and they correspond with the changes that we've seen in thyroid disease. This is not a, not a coincidence. Uh, we also have seen that there are a lot of dairy-free options nowadays, you know, like uh, non-dairy milk type products. And in the past, like uh, let's say greater than five years ago, those products were riddled with sea vegetable extracts, you know, a lot of derivatives of carrageenan. And, you know, I, I think that, I think in some cases we've been perhaps too concerned about some ingredients, but there was a big battle against carrageenan, and I'm, I'm glad it happened. I think it was the right battle, and it was effective. Uh, my, my friend Food Babe and many others made a big point about calling out its negative health effects and all the hidden food sources of it, and it's pretty much gone. You know, I've looked through non-dairy products, the beverages, the cheeses, the yogurt, the spreads, the frozen desserts, the egg replacers. There's nary a source of carrageenan to be found amongst those, at least not from my eye. And carrageenan can hide in other names, but even with the hidden names of it, yeah, these companies said, okay, if people don't like it and if Food Babe Army is against it, we're going to quit using it. And that really happened. So you've got a lot of options, you know, non-dairy beverages. There's the uh, 365 Whole Foods, the Organic Valley, the So Delicious, the West Soy products, the Silk products, uh, Rice Dream, and Oatly, just listing off a few brands that are out there. So these are milks that are made from soy, from almond, from milk, from um, uh, oat, from coconut, from, from rice, and you won't really find issues with them having iodine. Same thing about the cheeses, uh, Vegan gour Gourmet, uh, Heidi Ho, Dr. Cow, Daya brand. Uh, non-dairy yogurts, so so delicious, whole soy, Nancy's, Osoy, these are fine. Non-dairy spread, Earth Balance and Smart Balance are a couple of my favorites. They're actually the same product, but just under different labels, and they are free in iodine, and I've seen assays on that. Non-dairy frozen desserts, so this is not what you want to base your food intake off of, but for the occasional treat, you know, Luna and Larry's, the 365 Hold Foods, Organic Nectars, so delicious natural choice. These things are not going to give you iodine. And then finally, egg replacer. So egg yolks, much like dairy, can also be a big source. And it's for a lot of the same reasons. You know, not, not the teat sanitizers on chickens, that doesn't happen, but their feed. They can also be given fish meal, and they can also be exposed to iodine in fortification as well. And that's why the yolks can contain quite a bit. But uh, Bob's Red Mill egg replacer, just Egg, uh, the Neat Egg, Egg Beaters. These are all products that are devoid of added iodine. And I've seen ingredient lists, I've seen assays. So these things are fine that way. And just a, some quick highlights about dairy sources. I'm pulling up a list in front of me. So it's hard to find a lot of databases about how much iodine is in food, but I've created one by pulling together all the ones that exist some government ones that are not commonly publicized, and compiling them. And so dairy foods can range. I mentioned how you could find a glass of milk as high as 360. Sour cream, mayonnaise, they're, they're lower. Uh, powdered milk, that's going to be quite a bit higher. But mayonnaise and sour cream are amongst the lowest of the various dairy foods. Margarine, of course, since it's not dairy, uh, that's lower. Hard cheeses in general are lower. And during the thyroid reset diet, during the maintenance phase, 
I do offer the use of up to an ounce of hard cheese per day as needed. It's rather consistent as well. It's not as variable from batch to batch. But milks, yogurts, cottage cheese, soft cheeses like, like brie or gruyere, they end up being quite a bit higher, as, as does cream cheese. So those are some better options that way. And that's about why dairy foods are relevant. All right, Dr. C here with you. Take great care of yourself, and I'll talk again real soon. Bye-bye. Hey, Dr. Christensen here. Thanks so much for joining me for another episode. Is there a topic you'd like me to cover? I'd love to hear from you. Just go to Dr. Alan Christensen on Facebook or Instagram, write your question, and use the hashtag medicalmyths. Did you find this show helpful? If so, please take a minute and leave us a rating on iTunes so that others can know. Thanks much. I'll be back with you real soon. Bye-bye.